Hi everyone, we're gonna continue on with the video. I'm sorry that it cut off earlier, but that was because we had um, school starting. So let me go back. Okay, so we talked about single bond, double bond, triple bond. And then we looked at both um, carbon dioxide as well as the nitrogen molecule in terms of their Lewis structures. I also wanna talk about um, and I think I alluded to this in the last video. I can't even remember the day is kind of like just going on together. So this is just a set of data with nitrogen molecules. And I see that when nitrogen has a single bond between them, so if I have two nitrogens that just have one single bond between them, this is the distance that's separating them, 1.47 angstroms. And then if I have nitrogen with double bonds um, in between them, the distance is 1.24 angstroms. And then when I have a nitrogen with a triple bond in between, then that distance is 1.10 angstroms. So a general rule is that the length, when the length of the bond decreases, or the length of the bond decreases as the number of electron pairs, or shared, I'm sorry, as the number of shared electron pairs increases. So length of bond decreases as number of electron pairs increases, okay? So as I get from single bond to a double bond, I see that that distance is decreasing. From double bond to triple bond, I see that that distance has decreased. Ultimately, what's happening, um, because I have to have some type of atomic overlap of the electron clouds themselves, for this single bond to occur. So when I have a double bond, that means I have way more overlapping of these atomic orbitals. So I have more space now. These Ultimately, these two um, nitrogen atoms are gonna come together a little bit closer. Same thing with the nitrogen, nitrogen triple bond. Now I have three shared pairs of electrons. So they're gonna come in even more tight, even tighter than the double bond or the single bond. So I want you to know that a triple bond is the strongest in terms of strength. It's gonna be really, really difficult to break a triple bond versus a single bond is, is fairly weak because it's much easier to break. That overlap between those two atomic orbitals is not nearly as much as what the atomic overlap would be between three shared pairs of electrons, okay? So just a general rule of thumb, as the length of the bond decreases, it also happens that the number of electron pairs, shared electron pairs, increases, okay? So let's go back to our PowerPoint slide. Down here below, this says that the carbon-oxygen bond length in carbon monoxide is 1.13 angstroms whereas the carbon-oxygen bond length in carbon dioxide is 1.24 angstroms. Without drawing Lewis structures at all, do you think that carbon monoxide contains a single, double, or triple bond? Okay, so we just looked at carbon dioxide, even though it says not to look at Lewis structures. Um, we drew carbon dioxide up here, so it's hard to not look at it. We know that there's a double bond in that. So if the bond length for a carbon-oxygen bond in carbon dioxide is 1.24, and in carbon monoxide, it's a smaller distance, then that means, as our rule of thumb, let's go back, as shared pairs of electrons increases, the bond length decreases. So if a double bond has 1.24, and I need to figure out what the 1.13 will, will have, it should then be a triple bond. So carbon monoxide should contain a triple bond, and it does. So let's talk about the rules in writing and drawing a correct Lewis structure. I also then want to go through and talk about um, how to calculate formal charge. So then that way you can determine if you're drawing the best Lewis structure for the molecule that you're working with. So the first rule for our Lewis structures is we want to find the sum of the valence electrons of all of the atoms in either a polyatomic or in a molecule. So a lot of times we'll draw Lewis structures with polyatomic ions just because they're molecular uh, and, or I may have a molecule. So I know here that phosphorus has five valence electrons, chlorine has seven valence electrons, but I have three of them. 
So 21 plus 5 gives me 26. So if I'm just looking at PCL3, I'm thinking right now 26 valence electrons. So that's how many electrons I need to keep track of, and that's how many I need to represent with PCL3. Okay, if it's an anion, so let's say that you have a polyatomic ion. If it's anion, we add one for, add an electron for each of the negative charge, and you already know if it's a cation, we'll subtract one because um, we've removed electrons. Okay, so the second step, so first step is valence electrons. The second step, we have to find the central atom, and the central atom is the least electronegative element, and it can't be hydrogen, so it's the biggest thing. Hydrogen will never be the central atom. So central atom is the least electronegative element that isn't hydrogen. And then ultimately, once we find that central atom, we're going to connect based on a structural model. So now I'm going to draw a structural model or structural representation. I want to connect all of those with a single bond. So I'm going to connect any outer type, which all of the outer elements that are connected to the central atom I want you to call those another name. You can call them outer atoms, or we could call them ligands. Okay, so outer atoms or ligands, and either one of those would be fine, but you can hear them in, in either way, just so we're aware. Okay, so I'm still keeping track of these valence electrons, because now each single bond we know represents two electrons. So right now I have six that are shown on my structural formula or my structural model, and my goal is to get 20 more because remember we said we had 26. So first step, how many valence electrons does it have? Second step, let me find the central atom and then let me connect all of the outer atoms or ligands to the central atom using single bonds. Third step, I want to complete the octets of the outer atoms first, okay? Complete the octet of all of the outer atoms first. So if this already has two on each of the chlorines, I'm gonna add six electrons around. So I've added six additional electrons to three of them. So ultimately I'm taking, I had 20 left that I needed to account for. And then I had 18 more that I just added with those chlorines. So I have a leftover of two valence electrons, okay? so. Now that I've completed the octet of all of the outer atoms, I know I still have two electrons that are left. So the last step is going to be filling the octet of the central atom by placing any leftover electrons on the central atom itself. And now I want to check as kind of this like fifth step to make sure that all of those have a fulfilled octet. So I see that chlorine does on each of them and then phosphorus has six that it's sharing then plus that extra two. So I see that all of these have fulfilled that octet rule, so I am good here that I have zero valence electrons left, okay? So first step valence, second step find the central atom, which is the least electronegative element and it can't be hydrogen. Um, the third one, oh yeah, and then after we find our uh, central atom, we want to draw our structural model where central atom will go in the middle and then all of the outer atoms will surround with a single bond. After that, we fill outer octets of the outer atoms first, and then the last step is going to be fill in the octet of the central atom if you have valence electrons left over. What happens, though, if you don't have any electrons left over after you've already made the outer atoms having their fulfilled octet? So if I run out of electrons before the central atom has an octet, that's when we're going to form multiple bonds. I promise you that what happens for the most part on the AP test is when students start to assume that they know how to draw a Lewis structure because they're going to immediately start drawing double bonds or drawing triple bonds because they think that they already know how to do it. Sometimes they get that wrong because they don't follow these rules. So as long as you make sure that you're following these rules, you'll draw a Lewis structure perfect every single time. I promise you that. So for this example, I have carbon that's attached to a nitrogen, that's attached to a hydrogen. So actually, let's go and look at it here, okay? So I have carbon attached to a hydrogen, attached to a nitrogen. So I know that carbon has six valence electrons. I'm sorry, just kidding. Carbon has four valence electrons, my goodness. 
So carbon has four valence electrons. I know hydrogen has one valence electron, and then I know nitrogen has five valence electrons. Okay, so my goal then is to show that this has 10 valence electrons. That's my goal, okay? So I need to show 10 valence electrons. Hydrogen can't be the central atom, so my central atom is going to be between carbon and nitrogen. So whichever one is least electronegative, which will be carbon, so it's my carbon is going to be my central atom. Now I want to fulfill the octet for all of the outer atoms. So I want to fulfill the octet for hydrogen, fulfill the octet for nitrogen. Hydrogen's is already fulfilled because hydrogen only will want two electrons. That gives it that full outer shell. So we're good here for hydrogen, but nitrogen is not. So let's add six electrons around nitrogen. Okay, so my six electrons, or I could say I have one bonding pair of electrons and then three lone pair. So we'll call each of those a lone pair of electrons, okay? Now, if I go back and see, I have two, four, six, eight, ten. But does every element, now that I have my ten valence electrons shown, do they all fulfill the octet rule? They don't. Hydrogen does, nitrogen 